Welcome to this week's video and we're just going a little further into Luke chapter 14 this week for another part of uh, Jesus' teaching that Luke has edited all together in this, this section. So uh, Luke 14 starting at verse 25, the lectionary suggests you finish at verse 33 but I'm going to ignore their guidance and go to uh, verse 35. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor the manure heap. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, last week on the video, and then on the Sunday morning in my church at Knapp Hill, in the presence of my new superintendent minister, I said that a statement on the Methodist website claiming to sum up the Christian good news was actually no better than a half-truth. The words were... God loves you unconditionally, no strings attached, that's the good news. I said that wasn't the good news according to Jesus, who tended to say things like, repent and believe the good news. And yes, it's true that God takes the first step in loving us before we ever deserve it, but if it's to mean anything, we need to respond, and that can be costly. And we see something similar in today's reading. Here, there is a crowd travelling with Jesus, but he says that if you want to become not a member of the crowd, but an actual disciple, there's a price to pay. And that's a clue. Am I in the crowd, or am I a disciple? To be in the crowd, you just have to hear that attractive message that God loved us before we ever loved him and be intrigued. But if you want to be a disciple, then you have some big decisions to make in response to that love. The story is told of a child who asked mummy, do all fairy stories end with the words, and they all lived happily ever after? And Mummy replied, no. Some of them end with the words, when I became a Christian, all my problems disappeared. Becoming a Christian is not a problem-free decision. What do we need to weigh up if we are to be a disciple rather than a crowd member? Three things from the reading. Firstly, the cross. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, 
Such a person cannot be my disciple, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, just not over tangent, the, the language of hatred there is what's called Jewish hyperbole. It's extreme language to make a point. But carrying the cross is paralleled with hating your own life. Because carrying your excuse me, carrying our cross doesn't mean simply enduring whatever pain comes our way in the normal course of life. It means being on the way to die. In in Jesus' time, someone carrying their cross was on their way to execution. Their life had effectively ended. I think it might have been Winston Churchill, I'm not sure, who said that there was a difference between something that was worth living for and something that was worth dying for. Because only the latter is really valuable. And a politician of a very different hue from Churchill, namely Tony Benn, took this further when he said that he preferred those people who had a belief worth dying for to those who had a belief they thought worth killing for. And I wish I didn't have to say this, but this is what Jesus says. Being his disciple can mean being willing to die for our faith. Of course, we, we, we frequently comment that we're grateful how we don't have to face that choice in our society, and certainly we should be grateful. For, in one sense, though, we are in that situation, an abnormality. Historically, and in the present day, there are so many societies and nations where faith in Jesus and in his teaching is seen as a threat that millions of our brothers and sisters live with this reality on a daily basis. Each week I receive an email from Christian Solidarity Worldwide, in which they urge Christians to pray and act for those who are suffering for their faith around the globe. In the last week, we have been praying for Christians in Pakistan who are falsely accused of blasphemy against the Islamic prophet Muhammad, a crime that carries the death penalty and people with petty disputes against a neighbour sometimes try and invoke this law in Pakistan. We've also been praying for those people who have been forcibly disappeared, either by government forces or by terrorists because of their faith and their willingness to speak up. These have included people in Malaysia, in Peru, Nigeria, China and other places. Some of these people have been missing from their families for years. So I ask, is our faith worth dying for? So firstly, the cross. Secondly, counting the cost. Here is um, a quotation from the tourist guide to St. John's College, Cambridge. Some of you know why we happen to be interested in that institution at present. But here is a quote from the tourist guide relating to the magnificent chapel at St. John's. The 19th century chapel was designed by Sir George Gil Gilbert Scott, apart from the tower, which was an afterthought made possible by a former member of St John's called Henry Hoare, who unfortunately died before he could pay for it all. Now, in a slightly similar way, Jesus talks in our reading about working out whether you can pay for a tower before you build it or a king calculating whether he can afford to wage war against another king. And Jesus concludes, 
in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. There is going to be a cost if we decide to follow Jesus. Although John Wesley found that some of his converts became better off when they found Christ because it meant that they gave up spending money on worthless and unhealthy things, nevertheless, the way of Jesus has a cost. It will call us to be more generous with people in need. It will sometimes have a negative effect on our popularity because people will mock Jesus and anyone who follows him. It may have a cost in the world of work or even in a social organisation where following Jesus may involve taking an ethical stand. We might have promotion blocked. We might not be able to hold office. It may have a cost when family members or friends think we are crazy and dissociate themselves from us. So Jesus says, if you're going to move from the crowd to the disciples, you'd better count the cost. Right now, millions of us are literally counting the cost in our society as we face a level of inflation that we haven't seen for decades and wonder what the coming winter has in store for us with the balmy energy prices. We're trimming the fat from our budgets. We're cutting our energy use as much as we can. These are sensible things to do. And if we do that in the economic world, should we not also do it in the life of the Spirit? What will we need to give up in order to follow Jesus? So, the cross. Counting the cost. And thirdly, the commitment. What Jesus says at the end about salt losing its saltiness is a matter of commitment, not chemistry. For as one scholar puts it, the final saying about saltiness makes less sense to us than to Jesus and his audience, since we cannot quite imagine salt becoming unsalty. But salt from the Dead Sea was in fact a mixture of all sorts of things, salt itself being only one ingredient. If the salt crystals themselves were dissolved away, then the remaining residue would be useless, fit for nothing. So what is Jesus saying to us when he warns us not to let the salt lose its saltiness? He's saying, don't let your faith in Jesus get dissolved in the wider culture. It's a call to retain a commitment to our distinctiveness as Christians. As faith in Jesus began to spread across the Roman Empire, there were certainly situations where the temptation before those early disciples was to dissolve their commitment to Christ in order to have an easier or a quieter life. One example was that under Roman law, Judaism had some special privileges which were not extended to the followers of Jesus. If they wanted an easier life, they could roll back all their emphasis on Jesus and just say they were good Jews. That's what the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament is all about. And it's why the writer urges them on by remembering the supremacy of Jesus. So don't dissolve that commitment. Or another temptation in that world 
was when good Roman citizens, whatever their religion or culture, were enjoined to burn a pinch of incense to the emperor and say the words, Caesar is Lord. Surely just saying that once every now and again would be harmless. But no, because it was a denial of who Jesus was. So to do it would be to dissolve their Christian faith. They had to resist whatever the cost. Today we face our own temptations to dissolve our commitment to Jesus so that we fit in with society. It can come in various forms urging us to change our attitudes to money and possessions, to career and ambitions, to sex and relationships. And sometimes people in the church tell us that the best way to reach people today for Christ is to adapt our faith to today's standards. But given what Jesus says here about the risk of salt losing its saltiness, we have to say that such a strategy is spiritual suicide. Jesus calls us to a distinctive commitment. You know, I, I, I wrote the words of this talk with a heavy heart. Not another one, I thought, where I'm talking all about the cost and the sacrifice of following Jesus. Surely there's some good news somewhere, rather than just having to proclaim yet again a faith that can sound so challenging and maybe perhaps so austere. But the reality is that our own culture is moving further and further away from Christianity as its basis. We do need to be aware of dangers that may soon stalk us. But beyond all that is that this call to costly commitment is only in the light of the costly commitment Jesus gave us. It does us no harm to remember the gospel message that Jesus gave up the glory of heaven for an obscure, poor life and death on the cross. So may the Holy Spirit grant us courage when the only response of gratitude we can show is one that involves us paying a high price. And may that same Holy Spirit go with each of us this coming week. Hope to be back with you next week, God willing. God bless you. Bye-bye.